Today's speaker is uh, Bill Middlecamp, and I've known Bill for a few years. Uh, Steve and I used to attend um, his progressive movie nights um, here in Apple Valley. And, um, and then we attended something at the zoo school. And that's when I found out about uh, interfaith uh, creation care and um, joined that, which Bill's also a member. Um, he has a degree in meteorology as well as computer science. He's a commissioned United Methodist Earth Keeper and one of 20,000 trained climate reality uh, leaders from around the world. And that's what he will be talking about today. Um, yeah, so we'll uh, do the presentation, leave some uh, time for some questions and then I'll wrap up by 10 o'clock so we can go to our next Zoom, which is church. <laughs> so I'll turn this over to you, Bill. Thank you. This is the famous blue marble image taken nearly a half century ago by our lunar astronauts. It shows our precious Earth from space and reminds us that we all share this one home. I want you to think about the vast blackness of the universe surrounding us. The Earth is a tiny speck compared to all of that but it's the only place we have to live. Think of the earth as a small lifeboat in the middle of the Pacific, thousands of miles from land. No one is coming to save us. Without the lifeboat, we will all surely drown. That lifeboat has sustained us throughout a million or so years of human existence. We know it can sustain us forever in terms of our myopic view of time. But for some time now, we've been drilling holes in our boat for short-term gains. Even now, those gains are steadily getting eclipsed by real losses, which is a portent of a dark future if we don't act now to change our profligate ways. In all the debate about the climate crisis, there are only three questions remaining. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? Let's take them one by one. Must we change? Well, what have we done? Well, we're using this thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet as an open sewer, and we're spewing all the man-made global warming pollution into it. Now, the natural greenhouse gas layer is good for us. Without the atmosphere in the oceans, the average temperature of the Earth would be about six degrees below Fahrenheit. Now, that's just straightforward physics of radiant energy streaming in from the sun and streaming out from the Earth into the cold blackness of space. But the atmosphere acts like a dam in a river to slow the outward flow of energy, which raises the average surface temperature to around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. At this balance point, the world has existed as we know it for thousands of years with a particular blend of liquid, ice, and atmospheric water vapor that support a favorable climate. For thousands of years, human society has been built up on the foundation of a fairly stable climate. But now, human activities are significantly changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, which is changing the greenhouse effect, and our precious climate foundation is changing with it. The greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are rising because we're spewing 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into it every day, treating it like an open sewer. Now, these extra greenhouse gases come from lots of different sources, such as landfills, transportation, burning forest and cropland, animal agriculture, and even the thawing permafrost is playing a role now. This last one is particularly worrisome because it's the start of a runaway tipping point that's very hard to stop. But the biggest source by far is our reliance on fossil fuels. And since World War II, that's been going up dramatically. Well, isn't climate always changing? What does warming really mean? Why does it matter if human activities are causing it now? Well, natural climate change is slow. It happens over thousands of years, which allows living things to adapt. The asteroid that hit the Earth 65 million years ago, it changed the climate in an instant and brought an end to the reign of dinosaurs. The Anthropocene, the name for this era when human activities are the biggest driver of changes to our planet home is more like that asteroid than it is to the Earth's natural cycles of change. In the Anthropocene, temperatures are going up very fast, 
changing measurably in a fraction of a human lifetime. It's unmistakably clear, and the scientists are telling us that last year was either the hottest or second hottest year ever measured with instruments, neck and neck with 2016. 20 of the 21 hottest years have been since 2001. The six hottest have been the last six years. These data show an undeniable fact. It's getting hotter on the earth. Now this is a bell curve, which is what you would see when you roll a pair of dice and plot the results. The number two double ones would be on the left and number 12 double sixes would be on the right, both having the lowest chance of occurring. That's why it's so thin out there. The number six and seven, the normal results, would be in the high occurrence white space in the middle. Now this bell curve shows normal temperatures as they were in the period between 1951 and 1980. The blue is cooler than average, the white are average, and the red are warmer than average, the typical bell, bell curve. Well, in the 80s, the whole curve shifted to the warmer side. And you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, the appearance for the first time of a statistically significant number of extremely hot days. Then in the 1990s through 2008, you see it gets bigger. And in the last 10 years, look at what has happened. The extremely hot days are now more common than the combination of cooler than average and what used to be the normal, the white stuff. In fact, these extremely hot days now cover more than 200% of the amount of Earth's surface than they used to cover back in the second half of the 20th century. These extremely hot days are driving many of the consequences we're seeing. Well, what is it, what is that warming, how does that warming affect human life? Isn't it better if the world is warmer? Well, we're seeing the heat go up all over the world. Last year, Miami had its hottest summer ever. Excuse me, last week, last year, Miami had its hottest week ever measured. This is Australia at the start of 2020, which is their Southern Hemisphere summer. Look at Canberra, their capital. They set an all-time high of 111 degrees. Now people die in this kind of heat if they cannot escape into air conditioning. Here, Ghana in West Africa is already one of the hot countries of the world. I'm guessing there's no air conditioning in that hot on the right. In April of last year, they set an all-time temperature record of 111 degrees Fahrenheit two degrees hotter than the previous record for their northern border. The people of this region are subsistence farmers. Climate change destroys their way of life. And then where will they go? Europe, it had its hottest year ever in 2019 and all these countries have set all time records. Norway at the top center of this map, I was there in Bergen on the very day they set their all time high temperature record. It was miserable. This is really shocking. In Siberia, above the Arctic Circle, it went above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 36, 38 degrees Celsius, the hottest temperature ever measured north of the Arctic Circle. Well, what about severe weather? Everyone should understand this. Warming produces more water vapor, and that's the fuel for storms. This image of the globe is centered over the Pacific. It helps us to remember that the world is mostly ocean. And in the world as a whole, it's useful to remember that 93% of all the extra heat goes into the oceans, and this disrupts the water cycle. We saw ocean temperatures also hit a new record in 2019, and almost certainly again in 2020. This makes ocean-based storms stronger. These temperature readings go deep, more than a mile. Look how clear these numbers are. We have to accept this data and follow the science where it leads us. So the accumulated amount of global warming pollution, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the others, that accumulated pollution is now trapping as much heat energy every day in the Earth system as would be released by 500,000 first generation atomic bombs exploding every day on the Earth. That's an unbelievable amount of energy, particularly when you multiply it by 500,000 times every single day. That's what's causing the temperatures to go up and all of the other consequences that we're gonna talk about during this part of the slideshow. All that heat magnifies the amount of water vapor coming off the oceans into the sky. When all of that water vapor comes over the land, 
The precipitation events increase, and when it rushes back to the sea, the floods and mudslides increase. You can see that all over the world, that massive precipitation events are happening more frequently every year. We're seeing rainfall that breaks all records. This dramatic image was taken in Montana. In the US, extreme downpours are happening 30% more often than they did in 1948. Globally, these rain bombs are happening four times more frequently than they were just 40 years ago. Well, must we change? Well, yes, because people are suffering and will suffer more each year. And where will people go if the weather destroys their way of life? We just saw this devastating storm last spring in the Philippines. More than a half million people were affected by it. And did you know that they suffered five back-to-back -back typhoons and tropical storms in the last few months of 2020? Much of the country was underwater. A good friend of mine lives there, a United Methodist earth keeper, and he said that his mother's rice crop was destroyed. People are suffering today, not just in the future. This massive storm barely got mentioned by US no News in May of last year. In the Sundarbans, the area between India, where India and Pag Bangladesh join, both countries were hit by the super cyclone Amphan. And in this region, people live very close to sea level and they're very vulnerable because they are very poor. And the people in the river delta there were devastated. Now there's, there's a lot of out migration from these low lying areas. And when they're rescued during the pandemic, it's an extra challenge. Here was one last summer in India and Nepal, four million people were displaced by the flooding and, and the mudslides. China in June, 700,000 people affected in Guangdong province. And in April, this one in Kenya, 100,000 families displaced. This was Tennessee last spring. This was New Jersey. And by the way, most minority neighborhoods are, and communities are far more affected. This was an image last year in New Orleans. We're seeing the same pattern all over the world. As Pope Francis reminded the world powerfully, the poor are the ones most affected and communities of color are most affected. Here in the United States, the Poor People's Campaign is campaigning against ecological devastation, along with racism and poverty and the other evils they've identified. If you look at the 10 counties most affected by flooding in the United States, 81% of the population is minority on average. Now, I've been asked to talk a little bit more about impacts to Minnesota. This is looking down on our border with North Dakota, showing normal Red River water levels and flooding on April 17th of last year, following an unusually wet fall and winter. We know this river has flooded in the past, but floods are happening more often and not just in the spring. We're seeing soybean sudden death syndrome, which has become the number one soybean fungal disease in the United States and it's related to climate. This other soybean disease called frog eye leaf spot is another example. This is a plant disease that affects zucchini, powdery mildew, that happened to me a lot in my garden last year. And there are other examples. Here's a way to put it all in perspective. If you look at the livelihood, the likelihood of what used to be once in a hundred year storm before the climate crisis, well, they were once in a hundred years. Now you get five in a hundred years. But if we allow the temperature of the earth to go up by two degrees Celsius, we're gonna to get to 20, 20 100 year storms every five, once every five years. Now, if you look at a once in 20 year storm, the same thing is true. We're gonna get 50 of those every other year instead of once every 20 years. It's not just the poor who will suffer. Let's talk about farmers. There's an old saying that there are no atheists in a foxhole. Well, there aren't many farmers who say that climate change isn't happening because they are seeing it on the front lines. That's a pattern holding around the world. You know, farmers were hurt in 2019 in the prime farmland of the Midwest. 20 million acres couldn't be farmed because of the massive downpours. My wife and I drove to Santa Fe, New Mexico in January of 2019. And as we drove through the Midwest, we saw huge piles of farm products outside of grain bins. Now, I assume they were there at least partly because of the trade war with China. And not long after that, flooding destroyed much of those products. 
and, and even this, the swelling of wet products destroyed the grain bins too. Now there was $20 billion in damages. That trucker, that tractor out there, it's pumping water out of that field. Seems almost futile, doesn't it? The same extra heat that causes these rain bombs and floods also causes the droughts by sucking the moisture out of the topsoil because it's warmer. So the droughts take more place more quickly. The groundwater is used up faster. North America is already being affected by the drought and the projections in, this, in the balance of the century are dire. But the conditions in Central America are already quite severe. And this area known as the dry corridor in Central America, it's the place from which most of these refugees are coming to the north border between Mexico and the United States, creating political dis disruption. This is Europe last summer, showing the dangerously low levels of groundwater there. The 2020 drought in Europe, Czech Republic, it was their worst drought in 500 years. In parts of Poland, the worst in 100 years. This is Chennai in India, the sixth largest city. In 2019, they almost completely ran out of water. Now solving these problems is expensive, but not solving them leads to the collapse of governments and the rise in world conflicts. Must we change? Well, wildfire season is longer and more dangerous. Who hasn't seen the news about massive wildfire losses all over the West? I've actually been on Zoom meetings where some of the people were missing because their homes were being impacted at that time during the meeting by wildfires. Now, that feels really close. When we have high temperatures and drought, we also see more fires. Look how closely temperatures and fires are correlated. And the fires have been devastating. This one, this is the one in June in Arizona, in California in 2019. You know, it's sort of ironic that solar panels, which are part of the solution for stopping climate change, they produce less electricity because of the smoke blocking the sun. And by the way, that affects crops too. The same thing was true in Australia at the turn of last year. The smoke from those fires circled the globe. And of course, in the Amazon, now these are largely man-set fires, but they're devastating as well. Most fires are set by humans, either accidentally or, or intentionally. The climate change exacerbates the problems by creating more fuel and wetter cycles and longer windows of vulnerability in dry periods. The prime minister of Greece highlighted climate change as fires impacted Southern Europe. Must we change? Well, yeah, everyone is impacted. But how are the wealthy impacted? Well, insurance. The reinsurance companies are pointing to these, all, these climate related disasters and they tell us that this is completely unsustainable. The cost of these finds its way back to you and me one way or the other. You know, in Minnesota, we've seen our rates go up because of more destructive hail. Who doesn't know someone who got a new roof because of hail? We've changed from being one of the lowest to fourth in the nation for weather-related insurance claims. Did you know that the insurance industry does not cover risks that are too common? Climate change will have them backing away from some of the things they've covered in the past. This big hailstorm was last June in Alberta, Canada, one of Canada's most expensive natural disasters ever. Look at the siding on that house. Let's talk about sea level rise. The heat is also melting the ice in Greenland. This marine glacier turned into water. NASA's estimate of the ice loss in Greenland shows us that it's four times faster than they had originally thought. Did you know that NASA can measure uh, this from space with gravitational satellites? It's called the GRACE mission, it's a fascinating story. The same thing is true in Antarctica where the ice melting has accelerated quite dramatically. Now, when this massive amount of ice in these two regions melts, sea levels go up. The top 10 cities by population affected by sea level are listed here. You see a lot of them are in South Asia, but notice Miami on the right. And here, the top 10 uh, ranking by assets at risk, now number one is Miami. On the left, that's a trillions of dollars. Sea level rise is the reason why this octopus showed up in a parking garage in Miami. 
Now the flooding, uh, the, the, the sunny day flooding, as they call it, that's associated with high tides, king tides, it cannot be stopped with the seawall because the geology of the area is too porous. Now saltwater intrusion is a real threat to their groundwater resources. And this may force us to abandon living in Miami, not much of Florida. In New York City and Newark, $130 billion of real estate assets is at risk. Building a seawall is possible there, but it will cost billions. But the people most at risk are those in low-lying Pacific Island nations, and in some places, they've already had to move. Our health and security are at risk. Our own U.S. military has said that climate change is a threat multiplier. Climate change creates problems for food and water and health. When people cannot grow their food or earn a living, they move. And the fear of being overwhelmed by refugees leads to the rise of isolationist and authoritarian governments and refugees, as we saw after the Syrian drought. This has destabilized the political equilibrium in parts of Europe. We have medical emergencies caused by the climate crisis all over the world. Let me tell you about some of these health consequences. Tropical diseases are moving toward the poles and air travel is one of the reasons why, but the conditions are changing due to the climate crisis. So these diseases can take root and become endemic. Air pollution kills 9 million people a year and the same burning of fossil fuels that creates the global warming pollution also creates the particulates that cause more lung and heart disease. It also makes people more vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic all over the world. More air pollution means a higher death rate from COVID-19. And again, we see this pattern show up worse among minority populations and poor populations. Black Americans are dying at a rate more than twice as high as white Americans from COVID-19. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, there are many reasons, but the climate crisis is one of the principal ones. And please don't forget this. Human life depends on the diversity of all life. We are in danger of losing half of all the living species on this earth in this century. Many factors contribute to extinctions, but climate change plays a, a large role, large part in this. So when you add up all of these costs, and we haven't even talked about ocean acidification or infrastructure or some of these other things, I'll add one more. It's the number one threat to the global economy. For the fourth year in a row, it's been designated as, as such. Now, that's a whole talk in itself, but let's move on. So do we have to change? Yes, we do. So what about the second question? Can we change? The answer to that question is yes, too, because we have the solutions at hand. And we're going to get into that in the second part next week. But let's have a quick look now. 20 years ago, the best projections for wind energy were that we could reach 30 gigawatts of wind energy by the year 2010. Well, we beat that mark in 2010, and we kept going. In 2019, we beat it by a factor of 22. Just look at the growth in wind energy. This is exploding now because it's the most economical choice. So wind, wind generated electricity is exploding on its own for purely economic reasons. With solar, it's even more dramatic. The best estimates 18 years ago were that the amount of solar energy we could install each year might reach one gigawatt installed per year by 2010. Well, we beat that mark when 2010 arrived by 17 times over. And last year, we beat that mark by 121 times over two years ago. This exponential curve is even steeper than the one for wind and rising even faster. And of course, one of the things that's driving this is that the cost is continuing to come down every single year. It just keeps getting cheaper. Because the cost of renewable energy continues to come down dramatically, to add some perspective, let me just say that one watt of solar generation capacity produces about 20 cents worth of electricity per year, and the panels are expected to last 25 years or more. So it seems to me that's a pretty good investment. Chile has the best place in the world for solar energy. Look at all of the solar farms that they have built and are approved for construction to begin. And this is a breakout scenario that we're seeing in quite a few regions around the world. It's a cause for tremendous hope we're seeing a very rapid transition. And we're not gonna run out of it because we get as much energy from the sun in one hour as all of the electricity the world needs for a full year. Renewable energy can be enhanced with storage capacity, which is also developing rapidly. But we don't need as much of this as one would think. Did you know that wind turbines produce more energy at night? Now that seems counterintuitive, but we have the data. 
This makes the combination of wind and solar more effective for providing a steady source of the energy that we want and need. The projections show that storage is a new trillion dollar industry, which is going to make solar and wind even more useful. And it isn't just batteries, there are many ways to store energy. In transportation, we're seeing the beginnings of a massive shift to electric vehicles. I've owned one fully electric car since 2012 and one plug-in hybrid since 2018, and I can attest that they are great to own and drive. Battery prices have dropped by 87% from 2010 to 2019, and we, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, we're about to cross the point where EVs start to cost less than internal combustion engine cars. As electric generation shifts from fossil fuels to sustainable resources, electric cars inherently cut down the production of global warming pollution. And this is another positive sign. So can we change? Yes, we can change. So the final question, the most important one, will we change? Well, that's partly up to us, but we've got the Paris Agreement. And as he promised, President Trump withdrew the US from that agreement, but not until the day after the election of our new administration. And President Joe Biden signed on Inauguration Day the 30-day notice to get back into the agreement, so we are back in that agreement. President Trump also promised to rejuvenate the fossil fuel industry, but circumstances were beyond his control. As the stock market shown in blue was going up, the fossil fuel sector shown in red was going down. Fossil fuels have been bad investments for some time. The word is getting out and we're seeing a huge shift of assets toward the sustainability revolution. Once the sustainable generating capacity is built, the fuel cost is zero. Fuel, fossil fuels cannot compete as their costs are always rising. Here's the overall value of ExxonMobil. And here's the value of Tesla surpassing that of ExxonMobil. And a lot of these companies now are coming to understand that they are facing a real crisis. Now, this is encouraging. In the United States, we're already seeing almost half of our states, more than half of our people, moving faster than the Paris Agreement requires. We're, cities, we're seeing cities move as well. And we're seeing businesses move. More than 240 global companies have pledged to go 100% renewable, and more companies are adding their names and pledges to this list every single day. And hats off to the rising young generation, the Greta generation, they're leading the way. They see threats to their future. They're demanding a better world as they have a right to do. So I encourage you to join those who are using their voices, using their votes, and using their choices to fight for our future, our community, and our world. Use your voice, use your vote, use your choices in the marketplace and elsewhere as if your world depends on it. Speak truth to power because actually your world does depend on it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, I think we're small enough that people can just unmute themselves uh, to ask questions. Um, I mean, you always can put it in the chat too and I can ask Bill, but if you uh, have questions, um, uh, we have a few minutes before we need to go to church, so. So Bill, um, there was like a climate um, summit or something in the last few days and Biden. Yes made some new commitments on our behalf. What's new about that? Um, I am not real up to date on what's been done, but I know it began with a separate meeting between uh, Xi, Xi in China and Biden and uh, an attempt negotiations to try and smooth some of the uh, issues that have risen over the recent years in terms of our ability to cooperate with China. And they were looking for China to make commitments. Uh, China is still, they are leading, frankly, in developing solar energy and, renew and wind energy. Uh, they have some monstrous solar farms that you can see from space, like nine square miles of solar panels, and that's just one of them. Um, and so the, the, the hope was that China would make these commitments. And I thought I heard that they were, they were talking about being carbon neutral by I don't know, 2050 or something like that. The thing is, you know, we, we have lost a lot of time and it is rather than rounding the curve and starting to come down, we've continued to go up. And so it's like, 
you've got one line that's the reality of, of science and climate, and you got the other line, which is the reality of us exceeding the Earth's carrying capacity for humans and its ability to absorb our waste and deal with our pollution. And these two are coming together. And, and you know, this narrowing of the reality is going to cause, I think, more radical changes to occur. We keep hearing um, leaders of business and industry asking for more time. And I think, frankly, that um, they're putting themselves into a real bind where you know the last thing they want is to have what's called stranded assets, where you've paid money for something and you expect it to last you know, 50 years, 30 years, whatever. And all of a sudden at 10 years, you're being told no, you can't do that anymore. And this is, I mean, this is not just a political decision. We're talking about the hard realities of science and uh, our health and our world stability. And uh, we're just going to see stronger uh, requirements. So I'm excited to see that they're talking about putting you know, stakes in the ground because as soon as you do that, people start to find ways to do things. Uh, if you think that, well, I'll deal with that tomorrow, you're not going to do anything, right? But uh, one of the things that was really encouraging that I just saw is um, Elon Musk has a charitable foundation, <clears throat> and they have committed $100 million to a prize for whoever can come up with a way to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it's a five-year time window on it. So after the first year, the most promising uh, threads are going to be evaluated and they're going to be given some seed money. And then at, at the end of five years, the number one best solution could get $50 million. And they have to show that it is um, at a fairly large scale at the end of the five years. And they have to show that it can go to much bigger scale. So exciting things are happening. You know, humans are very clever. And when we when we measure with the reality and when we you know, accept the reality, then uh, we, we find things, we find ways to do things. So I'm encouraged by that. Yeah, that's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is that then we think, oh, we don't have to do anything because science will get us out of this somehow. I mean, there is some magical thinking with that. that yeah. That something's going to happen and we won't have to, you know, do all the things that we're really going to need to do. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm assuming that a lot, of, oh, go ahead, Phyllis. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, what are some of the major decisions that we can make as individuals? I know, you know, to keep our voice going both politically and with consumers, uh, we have just put solar panels in our house and we're absolutely delighted <laughs> with the great. whole project it's great but what else can we do to help the planet um you know we've talked about recycling and composting and that type of thing which is one piece of it but it's not the big picture piece is there a a consumer's guide for what companies we should be supporting financially if we have you know, the need for their products? Uh... Well, if you are an investor, and that's a very good thing to talk about, you should read the annual reports and find out just what the companies are doing. Every company and you know, the large investment firms are requiring this now. If you're going to get money from these institutional investors, you have to show that you have a clear understanding of how climate change affects your business and what you're doing to, to deal with that. What to, otherwise, you're not a worthwhile investment. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, one of the big changes that we need to make is we need to electrify transportation. That's a major source of greenhouse gases. So you might consider buying an electric car. I frankly think that um, it's a, it's a scary transition to make, but once you make it, you know, it's just like your solar panels. You'll be thrilled and, and you'll enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> another very large, and we're going to talk about this next week when we look into the simulation, 
a large source of greenhouse gases is our buildings. Uh, so um, companies that uh, especially help low income homeowners and apartment dwellers with improving the efficiency of their dwellings can have a big effect. And there's this thing called on-bill financing where a utility sends experts to your home they assess what are the low hanging fruit that you know you could save money uh, fast enough that it's worth investing and then paying back with your monthly payment. Um, so the owner actually sees an immediate drop in their bill, uh, but not as much as the savings because that difference is being used to pay off the loan. And then after a few years, the loan is paid off and then they get another drop. And what's really cool about this is um, if you're in an apartment, you're never going to make an improvement like that because you're, you're going to walk away from the apartment and somebody else is going to benefit. But when it's done with this on-bill financing, it stays with the meter. And so you don't have any of your own money invested in it and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to have the credit rating. You don't, you know, it's like it all just magically stays with the building. Um, so that's, that's something that I haven't seen yet. I'm hoping to find some way that individuals could maybe invest in the funds that support that. Um, I think that really the biggest thing that we can do as individuals is to talk about it, to help our neighbors allay their fears and be more comfortable with these solutions because people are afraid of the big unknown. They want to stick with what they know. And so they resist change. But if you can show them that you've made changes and it's not a sacrifice, that you actually get enjoyment out of the change, that it makes your life better at the same time as it's helping our world. That's what we need to develop the political will to then give permission to the politicians to go ahead and make the changes that we know have to be made. Yes, I noticed Minnesota was not on your list of states hmm. that was doing better in that list of companies uh you would have seen uh, 3m and general mills and uh there's another one that i'm forgetting right now but companies that understand that uh, not only is our future as a society dependent on addressing this problem but rather their company also their companies uh, future depends on having the right approach to this problem. And a company like 3M, you know, they can benefit by producing products that people need for, you know, home improvements to save energy. I just heard a number, and I'm sorry, I can't put it into a good frame to understand, but we need a, a dramatic amount of changes to our buildings. Uh, we have to have conversions to more energy efficient homes and businesses at an extremely rapid rate. So, I mean, you can look at, um, you can look at this from a profit perspective and the value of your own investments. I think some of these, you know, these companies are going to do very well, but you can also look at it as a way to say, all right, I, I vote with my dollars that this is a company that's doing a good thing and I want them to be successful. So I'm going to help them. Mm -hmm. Has has Minnesota had uh, bills before it to comply with the P P Paris Accords? I think that was the list. So, um, you know, the uh, there was some legislation that was done in the early 2000s having to do with uh, extending the permits for Prairie Island to store nuclear waste in these so-called dry caskets. And um, there, was a, there were a bunch of things going on. I think that was during the Palenti administration. There were a bunch of things that were put in place that led to the development of these wind farms that now we're really enjoying. And I, I'm, I'm mentioning these because they take a heck kind of time frame. You know, it's been almost 20 years since those were put into place. And now we're really seeing the fruits of that. There's a bill right now, it's called the ECO Act, E-C-O, and um, it is, uh, 
you know, you've all probably taken advantage of some rebates for making energy efficient improvements in your house, like buying LED light bulbs and so on. And you can send receipts to the power company and they'll give you some cash. Um, that is called CIP, uh, Conservation Improvement, I think, plan or some program. And I don't know if I've got the acronym right, but CIP. And the thing is, most of that, most of the opportunities for CIP funds have been used. I mean, everybody's got LED light bulbs now, for example. And so we're seeing a diminishing return on that program. I mean, it's not like money's being wasted, but there are fewer opportunities to spend the money. So what the utilities are asking is for that program to be expanded to where companies can switch to a dual fuel system. So they have electricity to power their buildings and electricity, electricity is always getting cleaner. So that's very helpful, but they, we can't rely on that because you know, when a polar vortex comes along, we need them to get off the electric grid so that other important uses of electricity can, can be sustained. Um, so what they want is to say, all right, if they spend money to have a dual fuel system where they can go on propane or natural gas, or something else while we're having one of these emergency peak systems, then we should be able to spend those dollars that are made, they're, they're intended to drive down energy consumption and improve energy efficiency. Uh, that would be a good way to move the program now. It should evolve. Well, there's a lot of resistance from the fossil fuel industry against that. So speak to your representatives and tell them you support the Eco Act. We also have um, the clean cars rule uh, adoption process in, in place. Uh, it's going forward. And we're seeing a lot of resistance from some legislators who are trying to um, sabotage this program. It's being done with a rulemaking prog uh, project, uh, process uh, because we couldn't get the legislator legislature through, especially the U.S. or the uh, Minnesota Senate. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here, but um, you know the Minnesota Senate is is dominated by Republicans. They have control of the Senate, and they they put a stop to these things. Well, this rulemaking process basically it's slower, but it's a way to get around that intransigence. Well, they're trying to create bills that say things like. Um, you can't, if you force car makers to sell electric cars in Minnesota, and that's what the rulemaking process is about, is that you know, they're not coming to us and we can't buy the cars that we wanna buy because they won't market them here. They won't sell them here. Uh, so now they're, they're trying to put a pl in, in place these uh, laws that say, well, any car that's not sold in 90 days has to be bought by the Minnesota government which, you know, it's, it's non-starter that, that would kill the, that would oh, kill that yeah. rule, right? So we need to speak out about that. Electric cars are not gonna ruin anybody's day. You know, you can still buy a fossil fuel car if you want to, nobody's gonna be forced to it, to do that. It's just gonna say that we want the same clean air rules that they have in California and many other states. Most recently, I think uh, Colorado might have been the most recent one to adopt these rules. Um, we want them here because we want choice. We want the manufacturers to make a conscious and intentional effort to sell those cars in Minnesota. So that's another one you can talk to your legislators about. And say, no, we was, want the clean cars. Clean, that was the clean car. Um... So the, process, the rulemaking process is the clean cars rule. Okay. And the the counter attack, if you will, is all kinds of laws that the Republicans in the Senate are trying to put in place to undermine the clean cars rule. Okay. Yeah, and I know that our representatives, Beerman, they're, they're all yeah. in support of it. So uh, we do have a chance here, but we need to give them support that, that we want this. Um, so, well, uh, we're Thank at you. that magic hour where we have to go and pray now <laughs> pray for yeah, that's right pray for the strength oh. to get this done right <laughs> exactly um so we'll look forward to uh to next week bill thank you so much for joining us
you know, Bill was uh, supposed to be our presenter um, the Sunday that we locked down. <laughs> and so we're so happy that we, it's, it's virtual, but he's finally here. <laughs> and so, very glad to be here. Thank yeah. you all for this opportunity. Yeah, thank, you. And thank you so much. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> God bless you. You too. Bye-bye.